Great. Beautiful. Welcome, welcome everyone to our last day of the Integral Conference. I'm so happy seeing you all right now, and I'm so excited to introduce the session. Welcome, Khaled El Sherebini. Beautiful having you hello, with Anna. us. Hello, welcome, hello, everyone. Beautiful. He's an Enneagram professional and spiral dynamics integral practitioner. He holds his PhD in engineering and master in environmental sciences in technology management. And he's just finishing another one in psychology. He is the author and teacher of the psycho-spiritual programs Awaken Through Enneagram, internal, integral Enneagram, integral Enneagram teacher and trainer where he combines this Enneagram with integral model to create tools for psychological and spiritual growth. Welcome, Khaled. In this session, he presents the methodology and the research behind the integration and synthesis of the Enneagram with the structure stages to create a model describing the growing up process of the Enneagram typist, which he calls the stages of the mind model. You will find much more details about his program. I will put it right now in the chat, uh, his page. Also in the end, you will have possibility to get some additional information where to get more uh, about it. So I'm happy to hand over to you. The stage is yours, Khaled, welcome. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. And thank you, Malcolm, for the uh, technological support. And uh, I want to really praise the IEC committee and management for the great work that they're doing. The conference this year is, is beyond the description. And uh, thank you all for coming. So many of you, we have met in so many sessions and uh, the conference has made us uh, feel so close. The integral world seems like a family. Although it's, it's expanding rapidly, yet somehow this resonance of hearts and minds in a, like a common purpose and a common sharing makes us all feel so close to each other. Uh, today, I will be presenting my model. Let me share the screen. So I'll take one moment just to organize my screen here to be able to see you all while sharing the slides at the same time. Excellent. And thank you all for coming. I see we're approaching uh, 60 people. So uh, I hope you enjoy this session today and you come out with something that can be practical and beneficial. Lovely. Now I see you all and I see the slides. So today I will be talking about the stages of the mind model, which is actually how the Enneagram types grow up on the uh, structure stages, the spiral and all the developmental models that talk from the cognitive perspective. I'll be giving a brief background about the model and where it came from and how it, and how it developed. And then I will talk about the models that came into this meta model, which is part of a framework. I'll make all that clear in a moment. I will briefly talk about the methodology behind the research and the, and, the, and the research process into reaching this model. And then I will have the bulk of the presentation. So most of the presentation will be into showing the major findings, how the Enneagram types in general look at each stage of development. And I will make that even more practical by focusing on one specific Enneagram type. I always like to do this in my presentations, focus on one and I will change today to a new type and show a practical application of how that applies to that specific type. A lot, I have, uh, I'm very uh, in, uh, enthusiastic, but also hoping to cover so much material today. At the same time, I'll try to go as slow and not too fast, not too slow, but to be able to give you a taste of all these different topics and at the same time, leave at least a 15 minute space at the end for question and answer and feedback and discussion. So let's dive straight in. First of all, a background about myself. 
As Anna thankfully said, I have a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from West Virginia. I have a master's in environmental sciences and renewable energy. I have an MBA in innovation and technology management and strategic management. And I'm currently finishing a master's degree in transpersonal psychology. Wow, what a shift. And just as the education is so uh, diverse, same is my working career. So for my whole life, I've worked in so many things, a university professor for quite a while. I've worked in research centers, maybe the most, the, the peak of my research uh, experience was working for a few years in the aerospace center in Ukraine, where we designed and launched the first Egyptian satellite under the supervision of the Ukrainian uh, sciences scientists i also uh, in corporate worked a lot in research and development and for a while i was the prime r d uh, director in many egyptian companies and also i've worked as an executive consultancy and all this is what i call my old life parallel to all this at the same time there was always this search for meaning search for purpose why are we here? What are we doing? Into what today I would call a search into the nature of consciousness. At that time, I had no idea about all these models that we're talking about. I didn't know about the integral. I didn't even know about transpersonal psychology. That was a very new word to me a few years ago. Yet, and, and actually, if you look at the previous slide, this is what I call, I was searching. I was getting every path, taking it to the end and then finding, no, I still don't taste the meaning of life. And the big shift, what Stanislav Grof would call a spiritual emergence, also with a little bit of a spiritual emergency, came to me when I discovered so many models, starting with energy work and Reiki and NLP and family constellations. And, but the real, real shift happened when I discovered the Enneagram. I remember the first time I saw the model described to me in a very simple way, something hit my heart immediately. I said, yes, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And though the Enneagram, as we will see in a minute, mostly in the Enneagram world is presented as a personality model, yet I could see in it something much deeper than that. And today I teach an Enneagram, I call it an Enneagram program or an Enneagram journey. It's actually a journey of awakening and transformation using many tools with the Enneagram as their prime tool. And I go using the Enneagram from personality to psychology, to wounds and inner child problems, to soul level, to transformational and spiritual level. So it's a one year transformational program. I was actually inspired for the program to work on myself, yet thankfully divine uh, inspiration, it has spread out so much, it spread out all over Egypt, the Middle East, and now it's spreading worldwide after I've started teaching it also in English. Now, besides the Enneagram, I also realized that there are so many cognitive and spiritual developmental maps. And it took me a while to put those into perspective. And my mind in general works as a map maker. I always try to put all these things together at the same place. And it it was very hard for me to figure out where to put all these. So we had the developmental levels by Don Rizzo and Russ Hudson in the Enneagram world. We had the David Hawkins map of consciousness. We had the stages of the self from the Sufis and we had the spiral dynamics. We had, uh, we had Maslow's work, we had Keegan's work, we had Piaget's work. Where does all this fit? And again, a huge inspiration came to me by discovering Wilbur's work whom I am forever indebted to. This was like the peak of my search. Suddenly everything fit in place. And I spent almost a decade really immersing deeply into the Enneagram and into the actual model and the different also spiritual models and psychological models that it refers to. And finally, I got inspiration to do the work I am going to present to you today. Now, I have to also give uh, respect and, and homage to some of the developmental work that was already done in the Enneagram world, and which is pioneering, profound, and also fits partially in some of my models that I'll be presenting. So many of them have been done, 
like Don Rizzo and Russ Hudson's work using the uh, maturity levels of the Enneagram types, uh, like uh, Dr. Deborah Uten's work, where she tried to connect the Enneagram types to the spiral dynamics specifically, and others. Yet my model expanded beyond all of these and included them, transcendent include, as we like to say, in the integral world, and added so many more dimensions to them. So what came out of this search? Out of this search came a three-dimensional framework. I call it a framework, the integral Enneagram framework. It is a meta model of meta models. That's why I call it a framework. And the three dimensions were the Enneagram, the cognitive or structural development stages, and the spiritual, psycho spiritual, or state stages. Out of this meta model came several models. It's better to put this in a graphical, visual shape. So let's look at it how it looks like. So we have the Enneagram in one dimension. The structure stages in a third, in a second dimension, these are the growing up stages, as Wilbur likes to call them, and the state stages or the waking up stages. Now, looking into this, you have stages of the mind, which is the Enneagram types growing up. So you can imagine the nine Enneagram types on this axis, each one of them growing up the stages. And we also have stages of the heart, which is the psycho-spiritual growth and maturity also of all nine types. Now, a byproduct of this model, which actually wasn't in my vision when I first started, came what I call El Sherbini lattice. And actually, I call it lattice here in reference, of course, and also in respect to the Wilbur Combs lattice. But actually, by creating this model and entering the lattice through the heart, through the state stages, not through the structure stages, I, was, I, I discovered some realizations that I have not seen in, uh, in literature. Yet, this is not the scope of our presentation today. So maybe I will present this in a, uh, next year's conference, hopefully. Today, I'll be focusing totally on the stages of the mind my cognitive growth model, and I will leave the stages of the heart, which I've presented in some earlier conferences for another time. So I call this the integral Enneagram framework. Now, the challenge that I faced coming into this presentation, usually when I present in the Enneagram world, people know the Enneagram. So I just briefly describe the structure stages and the model presents the structure stages in itself. So I don't have to go too deep. But here in the integral model, I know many people might not be familiar with the Enneagram too much, or at least in depth. So I have the challenge of trying to present the thing I love most maybe today in this world, which I teach over years in less than 10 minutes. So let's attempt to do that. I'll try not to go not too fast, not too slow, and cover a basis of the Enneagram. So what is the Enneagram. First of all, the word Enneagram is talking about this specific symbol, this weird symbol that you see in front of you. Enya is nine, gram is a symbol. So Enneagram is just simply the symbol of nine or the nine points or the nine dimensional figure. It's a very ancient uh, symbol. It can be found on Pythagoras's books. It has been used for everything from spiritual growth to understanding the processes in the world to knowing how the world functions. It is a profound, profound model. You can understand music from it. You can understand the cycle of civilizations from it. Somewhere in the 60s and early 70s, some spiritual workers and psychotherapists applied or mapped the, the psyche of the human being onto that symbol. And today in the world, when people talk about the Enneagram, they don't usually talk about the symbol. They talk about what we call the Enneagram of personality. And as I said, personality is a very limited word because actually it is an Enneagram of psyche. It's even an Enneagram of spiritual journey and meaning and drives of human beings. It breaks down humans into nine core drives, nine core defense mechanisms that as children, 
we built, we created, we got ourselves stuck inside to face the world and to have like a shield to prevent ourselves from harm. But these shields, which developed in childhood to help us, as we grew up, they became tight on us. They didn't grow with us. From one side, it is these shields which came out of traumas. We, we heard on Friday the magnificent presentations by Mark Foreman and Gabor Mate, where they talked about how traumas create our personalities and actually are a benefit for us. So all of us have to pass through this trauma. And I believe personally that these types are created through the greatest trauma we face in our life, the trauma of childbirth, the trauma of falling from heaven, from the mother's womb, where everything is perfect. And suddenly in a universe, we have no idea where we are. And we have to defend ourselves and realize who we are. And this is this trauma that we heal our whole life through our Enneagram types. And these defense mechanisms turn into behavioral mechanisms, into structural mechanisms, into drives, into identities, into attachments, into our sense of being our whole life. And we end up nine core personalities. Now remember, each one of us is a unique human being. There are no two human beings the same. And again, the magnificence of the, of the Enneagram is that this shows us so many nuances, so many subtle differences, that you can actually imagine us to be an infinite number of human beings as there are infinite number of dots around this circle. Each one of us in a state of personality and psyche identification, as long as we are stuck on the circle. And each one of us on a journey towards the light, towards the center of the circle from multiplicity to unity at the center. And that's what I call the stages of the heart. It's not the place here. That's the psycho-spiritual journey. What are these nine types? Now, what many people miss when they introduce the Enneagram is to remind people that since we have a journey from multiplicity to unity, each type has a low side and has a high side. It's like going from ego identification, I am, I am the wise person, I'm the achiever, I'm the perfect person, I'm the mighty, powerful person in control, I'm the faithful, trustworthy person, I'm the happy person, who am I? This is an ego identification. To dropping this ego identification or not dropping it, loosening it, we can never drop it. We're humans in a human body. And as long as we are on this earth, we have an identification, which is our role on earth. It's our purpose. It's our meaning. It's why we are here. So we are here to actually make the ego grow, to realize closer and closer to our true self, to our essence, to our mission on earth. We are part of one magnificent organism, one huge sense of being. We are not independent. We all grew out of this earth. We are all from dust and we go back to dust. So we were put on earth, as, as, as William Blake in his beautiful poem says, we were put on earth a little space so that we would learn to take the beams of love, the beams of light. We are here to expand this light within us, which is what I draw in this figure here. I say that this figure, this triangle, is the most profound spiritual model, you can understand all of spirituality by mapping it on this. It is a sense of going from contraction into a sense of expansion, from I am such and such to just I am to even beyond that. There's only oneness, I am not. But the Sufis call from annihilation, you annihilate the self, to, to substantial being as the one. This is the mystic path. The Enneagram talks about this path through three intelligence centers. If you want to learn about these intelligence centers in the most beautiful way, you can watch or read the lovely novel or watch the lovely movie, The Wizard of Oz. So 
So the Wizard of Oz is actually a mystic Sufi story that describes the path of realizing in all mythology, going home is the human finding themselves, the human finding their heart, the human coming home. And in there, she meets these three mythical beings who are trying to find their true heart, their true head, and their true gut. The gut was the lion, the heart was the uh, tin man, and the head was the scarecrow. So the Enneagram shows the path of these three centers from fixation. I call this in general fixation and passions of the heart, the, this, this tightness in the heart to these holy ideas and virtues. So that is the Enneagram in general, let's say the container. What are these nine types? Now, we could describe, and this has been a problem in the Enneagram world for a long time, it even tainted the Enneagram world for several decades, that the first people were actually psychotherapists. And they were always describing the Enneagram from down here, from this tight place. So anyone who learned the Enneagram ended up being pathological, being sick, so that's what psychotherapists do, that's how they see the world. And then later, a couple of decades later, more people started entering the Enneagram world and they started describing the Enneagram from where most people on earth exist, which is around here, just beneath the center. Most humanity lives here. And it was very interesting for me to look in so many maps, so many maps, and they all say about the same thing, that 70 to 80% of humanity lives in this place, just under the center line, trying to go up and then falling down. And this is the source of our suffering on earth, because this is a journey also from suffering and tightness to bliss, to peace in the heart. And that's why I like to remind people that no, the Enneagram has to be described from its high side, its low side, and its average side. Today, since we don't have much time, I will prefer to go against what the Enneagram world does and actually talk about the greatest gifts of each type. Why is each type sent on earth? What frequencies of light, if you can imagine the divine light to be this white light shining on earth, it passes through the prism of immanence from transcendence, it passes through immanence to shine into so many infinite number of frequencies, each one of us, one of these frequencies. And if we break them down into nine lights, let's look, let's look at the greatest gift, the light, each one of these nine types manifests in the world, the divine light that comes with each of these types. And what happens when it falls into ego identification? So type one, Type one is the sound of righteousness, of morality, of nobleness, of doing the right thing at the right time in the right amount. And when they are connected to their divine being, they do this with serenity. They do this without hatred, without resentment. This is Nelson Mandela. This is Gandhi. And then if they hold on too much the identification. If they start believing that they are the ones here to correct the world, they lose the sense of perfection in the world as it is right now. They fall into a sense of resentment, being perfectionists, always being critical and tough on the people around them. Remember, I described each type in several months. So this is each type in just a couple of words. I hope you can resonate with one of them. Type two and type two, three and four are actually driven by the heart, by the emotions, by the image, by value. I wanna have a value, I wanna have an image, I wanna have a sense of connection to the people around me. And no one represents this relationships and connection and bond between human beings as much as type two. This is the archetypal mother. This is Gaia. This is Isis in the Egyptian mythology. This is the Virgin Mary in the Christian mythology. This is the loving mother. I call her the, the, the mother, the Middle Eastern mother, the Mediterranean mother, the Jewish mother, the Arabian mother. This is the one who goes out and again, it's masculine and feminine. All these types are masculine and feminine. These are just archetypes. 
And this is the person who goes out of their way to help everyone around them. This is the source of true altruism, where I sacrifice so that everyone is happy. Again, when they fall into a sense of ego identification, they start becoming too overbearing, too intruding, too demanding, demanding attention, demanding love, demanding to be needed, demanding to be the most important person in your life, always proving to you their value, which also happens with the threes. But the threes are the ones who directly need to feel a sense of value. They need to act in front of you so that you would say, wow. Now that's an identification, but what is actually their greatest gift to the earth, they add value and meaning to life. I say that the threes have a golden finger. One and one equal two to most people, actually equals even 1.8 to most people. When people really focus and have synergy and have synthesis, they can make one and one become two. That's not enough for type three. One and one for type three has to equal five, has to equal seven, has to equal 10. They have a golden finger. They touch anything and they turn it into gold. Gold doesn't have to mean money, it has to mean value. They create cities. The modern civilization is built on a three. The American dream is a three. Dubai is a three. It's like creating so much flair and value. But if they lose sense of the divine, of the meaning, of the, of the authenticity, and they fall into ego identification, they turn into a sense of acting deceit always trying to act in front of you, just looking, begging for a sense of, wow, how did you do that? And they feel satisfied with that. So you see this journey, this journey from brightness and light to the darkness increasing as we go down. And finally, the, the, four, the third heart type, which is type four. This is the type that teaches us beauty and authenticity. Can you imagine the world without the fours, without the sense of knowing our emotions, being able to identify our emotions? You know the Pantone of colors that carries like a thousand colors within it. Now, anyone except the type four usually has a Pantone of like seven colors of emotions, especially when you go to the head types, the five, six, and seven. We usually hold just two or three Pantones of emotions. I'm either good or bad. But the type four actually can hold a thousand emotions together at the same time. They show us the depths of our humanity, the depths of our human being. They show us the connection. You want to see the brightest shape of type four, read the Sufi and the mystic literature of the world. Read Rumi, read Hafiz, read uh, for all the mystics around the world and understand this, this touch of longing for the beloved, longing for the annihilation in the one, going back to our source. Yet when they lose this sense of divine unity inside, they fall into a sense of melancholy. They become this melancholic artist. They have this need to express themselves, yet at the same time, they feel no one understands them, which creates a sense of deep deficiency as if they have been cut from the one. Read the song of the reed for Rumi and you will exactly understand the sense how the four feels inside. This longing of the flute for the reed bed it was cut from. And as I told you, I'll be choosing one type to focus on in this session. And for today, I chose to focus on Enneagram type four. Usually the hard types, the two, three, and four are the most expressive. You can see the greatest change happening to them across the stages. So it's very nice to present any one of the hard types. And actually I will do this in honor of my late mother who died about a year ago. And uh, I would like to present this in, in, in her spirit, honoring her spirit. She was a type four. Now I move to the head types, type five, and I hope I'm not taking too much time. Try to go a little bit fast, just a little bit fast. So type five, type five is the type that provides us a sense of clarity, illumination, wisdom. They show us the maps of the world. They show us how the world functions. They just look into the world 
and they see it. And this becomes the type of the scientists and type of the philosophers. And you can find here, or I didn't give examples for all the types, I forgot. In, in three, I actually mentioned some cities, but you can have lots of celebrities in three. In four, you have many artists. So actually I did. And in five, you have many scientists and philosophers like Einstein, like Nikola Tesla. And then you can even go back to, uh, to Socrates and Aristotle and many of the scientists come from here. It's the sense of clarity. This like one of the, the, the five's main objective is to reach the sense of, aha, this is Archimedes running out of the bathtub going, Eureka, Eureka, even he's naked, he doesn't care. He found it. So this is the highest point for the five, connecting to the divine wisdom. But when they identify with ego, they become aloof, separate, this detached from the world. They are overwhelmed. They feel they have a lack, a sense of scarcity, a sense of not being enough. And they just separate, you know, this is the archetype of the master or guru sitting up on the mountain. And if you want me, you come to me and you don't disrupt me. You don't interrupt me. You listen to me and you take my wisdom. So that's a sense of a bit of a tightness and identification and it gets worse into a sense of scarcity. Following from that, we go to type six. And type six is the sense of loyalty and trust of solidarity, of we are only safe we, when we are together. It's the type six that creates organizations, that creates societies, that makes us all stand together. It looks like the, the, the ant colony, the bee colony. You can find it. There is no distinction. There's no separate ego. We have to all dissolve into the sense of oneness, protect each other, all for one and one for all. No human left behind. And in this sense of, of this comes a sense of trust. I can trust you and you can trust me. Lean on me and I lean on you. But when the six loses this sense of identification, loses this sense, sorry, loses the sense of unity and fall into identification, they fall into a sense of anxiety of fear, I cannot trust myself, I need someone to protect me, I need someone to lose myself within, and I project my powers onto others to find security in others. And I fall into a continuous sense of what if, I'm always looking at worst case scenarios. Sense of anxiety continuous that never ends. And type seven, how would life be without type seven? This is the sense of freedom, the sense of happiness, the sense of lightness, the sense of break the chains, the sense of go out and do whatever you want and just smile and laugh. You cannot mention type seven without just having the brightest smile on your face. Just their energy brings lightness of being, brings light into the world. These are these lovely, when they're kids, they are the most bright kids ever. They just have to give you all these jokes and all these lovely, lovely catches. And I call the seven the smartest type because they're so fast in their thinking because they can connect so many dots at the same time. But then when they fall into identification, when the parents and the society try to break them, when the educational system tries to force them to sit on a desk for so many hours and they are made to jump around. They fall into this, I, this, this label of ADHD. Unfortunately, most of the kids identified as ADHD are just simply bright, beautiful type seven kids who want to enjoy life. And they show us how to enjoy life. When they fall into identification, they fall into restlessness, scatteredness. They cannot focus on one point. They have to have so many ideas popping like popcorn out of their mind all the time. They cannot finish a task. They have a fear of missing out. They want to do everything at the same time. Type eight. Type eight, and we're back to the gut types. So eight, nine, and one are the body types, the action types. And type eight is the type that is sent on earth to put justice to put power, to put everything, there's no, no one transgresses on anyone. 
They are the mighty type. They are the leaders. Most of the leaders that have led nations and conquered and built civilizations have been coming out of these type eights. This is Martin Luther King. And this is so many leaders, but, and, and they're full of power. But once they lose this sense of unity inside, they fall into a sense of being too much. Their energy is too much and they're always trying to control. They have a fear inside of being hurt and it ends up that they can actually hurt those around them. And the more we threaten them, the more rough they become. So they move from these enlightened leaders that change the world to these brutal, ruthless dictators that destroy the world. And here we have so many archetypes all across the, 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 the chart. And it's so much given figures in mythology, type eight. So this is everywhere from Achilles and Antara ibn Shaddad in the Arabian mythology to Zeus to Genghis Khan to so all the chart from a mighty hero that builds a civilization to a ruthless person that destroys those around them. And finally, at the crown of the Enneagram in its appropriate place, standing in a place to hold this entire system together, holding everyone from the five to the four at the peak of being and existence is type nine. This is the type of love, of harmony, of acceptance that allows everyone to be who they are. This is the type that can mediate that has a sense of knowing everyone, understanding everyone and getting everyone together. Most spiritual seekers, most prophets have come from this place. It's a place where I can tell everyone and teach everyone to know, to respect, to understand and to give space to everyone else in the world to life itself to be. This is type nine, but when type nine loses this sense of unity inside, they lose themselves. They start giving others space on behalf of their own self. They start wiping themselves out. They start self-effacing. They forget themselves. They don't know who they are anymore. So that was 10, 15 minute brief overview. Actually, I think I took too much, so I'll have to go just a little bit faster in the next slides. So that is the Enneagram. I hope you had all a very good sense of it. Thank you. Thank you for the hearts. And let's move on now to our model. Now, the second dimension in our model, thank you. The second dimension in our model has been the stages of development. And most of you know it, so I'm not going to go through it. It's just a picture from uh, Jeff Salzman's Daily Evolver. And as we see, there are so many models here. We will be following today Wilbur's aqua model and his ego development stages, cognitive development stages. And we will be using his colors. And I also show here, or actually Jeff shows here also the equivalent spiral colors. But again, the, 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 um, the advantage of using Wilbur's model is that Wilbur more focuses on ego development, on growth, on evolution, much more than uh, spiral dynamics, which mostly focuses on uh, harmonizing with the uh, external outside and inside the, the life conditions and on the value development. So it's still a profound model, a magnificent model. Spiral dynamics has changed my life, but Wilbur has added so much to it. So I will be mentioning both colors, although today I'll be mostly using uh, Wilbur's colors since we are in an integral conference. And those who are not familiar with these will become familiar as we go through the presentation. Wow. So now let's go to the stages of the mind model or the Enneagram types growing up. So the second part of my presentation, as I told you, is the methodology. As a scientist, as an academic, as a researcher, I believe that to have a, a, an objective model, a model that can actually be checked, built upon, corrected, which all models need. Remember, no models are right. 
All models are wrong, but some models are useful. So this model does not claim to be the rapid all. It just describes generalities of the stages and the types. So what was the methodology? And since from the Enneagram, we always like to make everything in nines. So I have a nine point methodology. I hope this slide is not too boring for you, but you will come out with a lot from it. So bear with it. It looks a bit overwhelming. The first point, knowing the two models is essential. If you really want to integrate two models, you have to know them both very well. But you have to realize that when you integrate two models, something emerges. And by emerges, it means that something is not evident in each model independently starts to show up, starts to appear. Those familiar with the Enneagram have heard about the subtypes. When we integrate the instincts with the types, something emerges. And it's this emergent characteristics that we're actually looking for. We also had to create a criteria for each stage independently. What we realized, and this is maybe something that the previous researchers fell into, is trying to create a criteria for all the stages. But what the Wilbur's model, the integral model, the actual model provides us with is so many sub models that actually some of them work at different stages better than other. And that will be evident as I present the stages. And as I said, it's very important to consider the high and the low of each type. So you also always have to look at both sides. Don't lose yourself into pathologizing, pathologizing a type stage. I call them a type stage. It's a type on a stage. And what I have realized in my work and in my research is that we tend by human nature to negatively stigmatize or negatively look at the lower stages. So red is always bad. Purple is always retarded, while turquoise and yellow are always magnificent. They're so enlightened. But actually, remember, these are cognitive development stages. And in each one of these stages, we have a spectrum. So when red came into the world, it was actually magnificent. It came to save the world, to create a much bigger world. But as it overstayed its existence, it became the place for bullies and criminals. So we needed each stage to look at the span, the span from the healthy to the unhealthy. As I said, it's easier to look negative down and positive up, but we'll try to balance it as much as we can. Now that we have these results, we need to validate them. And how do we validate them? We need to find real subjects in the world that we can test this on. And this is not a linear process. We are, it's actually cyclic. So we see subjects, we create a criteria, and from the criteria, we test on the subjects. So it is an iterative process that we go through. And I must say, I'm lucky to come from a place that is so diverse that I can find still pristine societies at all the stages from purple up to green. And this is an advantage I have had over many people from the West who usually are stuck in the orange green area, maybe with a little bit of blue. And then of course, we have to filter out the personal differences. We have to be sure that we're honing on this type stage, not introducing all the traumas and the growing up and, and, the, and the like uh, childbearing process and the traumas of the different people. And now this last three points, after we've done all this, I cannot present each type stage in a couple of hours. So I need to select a representative sample of characteristics that would deliver the message, that would make you feel how this type stage really is in the world. So that when you see them out in the world, even without finding the characteristics I've described, you would understand them. So first, finding a sample of characteristics to present the type stage. Second, finding some famous people we can point to. And I will talk about this point alone in the next slide. This is a very important point. Presenting people that you might identify with as coming from a type stage. And finally, trying to give a label, a name that would also connect you to this type stage. But it's very important while giving that name to not give it much of a positive or a negative connotation. 
to have it like a bit of a neutral name that you can understand. Done with the theory. The last two comments I have before diving into the stage type stages. One, when you use the pictures of people, this is a very dangerous point. I have to remind you always, these are just done as archetypes. We do not know the types of people. We do not know the stages of people, but we have an impression of who these people are. At least they try to show us an image. So by putting, for example, Tom Cruise, by putting Tom Cruise as an orange three, I neither know that he's an orange in orange stage, nor do I know that he's a type three. I don't know. Only Tom Cruise knows his type. And only Tom Cruise can figure out his center of gravity or mass on the structures. I can only help him find that. But Tom Cruise shows up to us in the media, in the world, as an orange tree. This person who wants success, who wants an image, who wants value. This is the three. And where does he put this image and success and value? In the area of the orange in the area of more, in this materialistic uh, uh, world of gain and, and being who you're supposed to be. So we don't know that the, these are just broad generalizations. The other thing with using pictures of people is that we tend to use celebrities. I mean, if I put the picture of my mother when I'm talking about type four, it means nothing to any of you. None of you knew my mother. So I have to put a picture of a celebrity. I have to put a picture of uh, Johnny Depp or Van Gogh. But then when I put a picture of Johnny Depp or Van Gogh, the simple four living in life cannot identify with Johnny Depp. What if I'm, a, I'm a, an employee in a company or a housewife or a mother or a driver or a, what does that connect to me? So again, these are broad generalizations that we need to bring down into our personal life. And finally, in my methodology, where can we find the people to check these stages or type stages on? Now, I know the Integral Conference, when it was done live, used to have this magnificent trip where they go around Hungary to look at the different stages. And I was so much looking forward to join that journey last year. Uh, but then the, the, the conference went online and I'm so much looking forward to the conference to be coming live again, all this magnificent community to get together again and to go on this lovely journey. But let's tell you where I found that in Egypt and in the Middle East. I'll break it down into three general groups. Stages of the past, the pre-modern, the first three stages, and you can observe these in growing children, in young children, in the families, in also earlier forms of living, in tribes, in villages, and in historical accounts that we find of civilizations that are of the past. Stages of the present, the conventional, so that was the pre-conventional, the conventional, the modern. And although in the West they usually talk about the modern as the orange green, I include the blue into it because I come from a society that has a huge sense of presence in blue. So for me, this is amber or blue, amber, blue, orange, green. And this is where I have most of my course identities, most of the people that come to my workshops, most of the people around us, and most of the famous figures that we see in media. And finally, where can we find the stages of the future, the postmodern, the post-conventional? My realization is go to the privileged classes, and look at their kids, look at their offspring. Don't look at the privileged classes themselves. They have created a space for their children to grow beyond them. So where do I find green in Egypt extensively? In the children of those who became successful in the 70s and 80s, who were tycoons, who were investors, and they, their children grew up in privilege. And they immediately jump in their teenage directly to green, even some of them already going to yellow by the age of 17 or, or teal by the age of 17, 18. So this is where you can find them. Oops, time is running. Let's go to our model. Where do we find infrared? 
Now, how do you put a color for infrared? I have no idea. So I don't know why Wilbur did this to us. I remember it used to be crimson. So I put crimson here. And we find it in the early Homo sapiens, in the basic human affects and drive, in the little kids that are just born in the first few months in very simple living ways. And that's why for beige, which for, for crimson, for beige, for infrared, I chose to hone on to children's affects, their core sense of being. And remember, we have all of these, but our trauma makes us hold on to one of these. So the type one comes from a sense of disgust something is wrong. And this is the survival mechanism of not falling into something wrong that can hurt us, that can kill us. Type three into a sense of competition. Type six, a sense of fear and anxiety from the world. Type nine, a sense of getting along, these babies getting along together to survive. Type seven, a sense of joy and happiness and playfulness. Nature is playfulness. Life is playfulness, is playful around us. Type five, with this sense of, oh my God, where am I? What happened here? Type eight, I can, autonomy, agency. Type two, this sense of needing to take and to give love and care from the world around us. And as you see, type four is lacking because I will focus on type four. So I'll go back to four in a moment. From there, as these children grow up, they become, ah, sorry, this is a slide, one of my attendees. So when I give this course, my last session is always a presentation where my attendees can present the different levels of the spiral from a type, or they can go over movies or books or mythologies. And we always have the best presentations ever. And one of our colleagues and friends and students, Frederic Cohen, was talking about the primate world. And he gave us this magnificent uh, realization, how you can see, because I said that this, this, this crimson infrared is the pre-homo sapien state. It's the primate state. So you have the charismatic chimpanzee, the type three, the wise old orangutan, the type five, the peace-loving bonobo, the type nine, the mighty gorilla, the type eight, and you can map the primate world onto all nine types. So this is the precursor to humans. And then before fully entering into our human skin, we first find ourselves identified with the family, with the, the tribe. And we are fused in a group. There is no individual sense of being yet. We play, we play a role a role in a family, it's like organs of a body, a child in a family and humans in a tribe. So just to make it closer, because in our modern world, it's hard for us to imagine. What does it mean not having an independent eye? That will only appear in the next stage. So in magenta here, in magenta, in purple, we find this sense of fusing with the collective. And it's very evident until today in the basic simple villages and in the Bedouin tribes. And I have a strong connection to villages, which is where my parents came from. And I have a strong connection to the Bedouin tribes of Sinai, where I like to go for my spiritual retreats, beautiful places in the Mount Sinai, the famous Mount Sinai in all the Abrahamic religions. They've all talked about Mount Sinai and Moses being there. It's one of the most beautiful places on Earth, in Egypt. And we find the Bedouin tribes, they're still pure magenta, pure tribal. So we find the warrior eight. Now each one now will have a role. It's not an independent self. We have the magician, we have the oracle. And I will not mention the types anymore. You can try to find and connect the types yourself. I will focus on the four, as I said. We have the oracle, we have the hunters, we have the medicine man, and we have all nine can be mapped on this stage where it's just roles in a tribe, children playing roles in a family. So you have the funny kid, you have the wise kid, you have the kid that's trying to protect the family. And from there, we go to red. And uh, in red, we realized something, this to me was, 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 was an aha moment again, a realization that the mythological Adam, this first human being as the sacred texts talk about, actually
actually seems to be pointing to humanity moving into red. Because it's this movement into red that suddenly we realize ourselves as separate human beings. Now, I'm not discussing was there an Adam as a person or does Adam refer to the human species moving into red? But in both cases, actually, it makes sense. When you look into the sacred texts of all Abrahamic religions, you find Adam seeming to be somewhere between seven and 9,000 years ago. I mean, there was agriculture, there was trade. So how can Adam fit? Yes, this is where red actually appeared into the world. So this is now connecting mythology with modern science and with modern psychology. And this is also where what we talk about the passions and the fixations of the Enneagram start to show up. It's only when I have an eye, as we know, Adam fell into shame, fell into the sense of I have to cover myself. This is the cover of the ego. This is the cover of the, the, of the, of the, of the type. This is the cover of the fixation and the passion. This is the cover of defending myself from the world by this having from the tree of knowledge, the tree of knowing who I am and what the world is around me and rediscovering myself. So this mythical fall from the Garden of Eden, from magenta, from purple, this perfect harmony with, with the Garden of Eden is the universe into the sense of separation, the sense of being alone, the sense of being me. And this is where we find these mythical heroes, the rebels, the, the troublemakers of the world. And in Egypt, red is very much uh, available. We find them in all the, let's say, uh, underprivileged societies in Egypt and in the Middle East and around the world. It's very, very famous. You see it in our movies. You see it in our series all the time. The sense of vengeance, the sense of I will not let go of my rights the sense of not having any consequences. I have to do it now. And this is the archetype of the rebel, the, the teenager that is rebelling against society, trying to prove it is me. This is the stubborn child, the type nine being stubborn. No, this is the, 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 the horrible the horrible twos as they call them, I, I believe. This is the vizier and the, the, and the wizard that is using their knowledge to have power in the kingdom. And again, today, it would be this person using their understanding to control those around them. This is this hidden, this is cool agent. I can, and I do it in style, and I don't care about anything because I can. This is the type three. This is the hedonist, the type seven, getting what I want, frustrated at the world and wanting to enjoy with no boundaries, breaking all the limits. This is the big, friendly, neighborhood, powerful guy. And this is also the thug. That's why here I put these two pictures. Because again, we tend to look at red in a bad way. Yes, it can be the thug, but it can be this beautiful, friendly guy who we all enjoyed watching his movies. But Spencer, we were growing up cheering him because he's always defending the weak and trying to have goodness in the world. And this can be the, the, the scheming, the type six defending themselves with all kinds of traps. So let's go to type four. I promised you to focus on type four. So how does type four look at? I call them the alien. Now remember in Crimson, there's still no sense of me. So this sense of separation I have fallen from the womb and I don't know who I am. And usually type four at this very early age still don't have what's described in this Enneagram books of all this melancholy and moodiness and attacking the others. Most of the parents of type fours have told us that as little children, they were very calm, sitting by the windows, just in a sense of contemplation. It's like discovering what is this world around me? Where am I? as if I've lost something. There's a sense of pure sadness inside. And it's the sadness that will let them become searchers, searchers for meaning and understanding of ourselves later in their life. Sense of pain, sense of abandonment, aloneness. Why have I been abandoned? I want to go back to unity. I want to go back to oneness. And as they grow and take a role, they become in magenta, what I call the psychic, 
or the magician. My students have preferred the word magician, although I, although I like the word the psychic. They represent archetypally this mystic feminine energy, this energy of receptivity, this energy of waiting for the lover, waiting for the divine. If you look at all the novels, it's always this beautiful uh, princess waiting for Prince Charming. And this is actually the downgrade of this mystical feminine journey of the feminine energy waiting to embrace the masculine energy. This yin yang of oneness, of light. So while you would have the active types, the masculine and the receptive types of the feminine, this is extreme in the magenta. And this is where the source of imagination, of mysticism, of symbols, of clairvoyance, of creativity, but it comes with a sense of hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity to physical and psychological pain. They become great narrators, great storytellers, great interpreters of emotions, great creators of symbols. They protect the group from the unknown, from the mystical forces, from the genies, from the ghosts. And they, they, with the five, can become the shamans. They love to have color and makeup. They create art, although they don't call it art. They call it self-expression. And it's when they move into red that the sense of i appears, the sense of separation appears, and they suddenly feel deficient. And it's this deficiency that rules their entire life. Something is wrong about me. They become frustrated, they become rebellious, always asking, why me? And this is the source of their envy. And this envy is a sense of, why me? Why am I lacking something? Why am I missing something? Why doesn't anyone understand me? Which gives them a sense of entitlement. And they become very intense, rebellious, attacking those around them if they don't understand them, even though they don't understand themselves. And depending on their level of maturity, they can wallow in suffering as victims, they can be manic and frenzied, or they can be creative, imaginative, ingenious, geniuses and ingeniuses, or they can, become per they can become victims or perpetrators. So this is where they come out wildly into the world. And James Dean is a very great example here, or rebellious teens. Now we move into the conventional states. We move into amber, or blue. And this is by far the easiest to model. And actually, again, one of our discoveries was that most Enneagram types in Enneagram books are described from amber. It's because the pioneers of Enneagram mostly came from this stage. So when you read Enneagram books, you find archetypes coming from here. And it's always a sense of relating to a place, to a system, and being loyal to it, to a religion, to a structure. Most Middle Eastern civilizations and societies today are amber or red amber. And this is most of the society that I grew up around, this charismatic leader, these religious, religious authorities. And most of our elder generation today in Egypt and in the Middle East come from this place. So this can be represented by the scholar in any tradition. This is the loyal citizen, the compeller that has to compel and lead with power. This is the Middle Eastern mother, the traditional mother, the Mediterranean mother, the Italian mother, it's named in so many traditions, the, the Far Eastern mother. This is the rationalizer, the escaper, that wants, the, wants to stay in the system because they're amber, but want to break the borders of the system or play, play at the edge of the system. That's the seven, of course. The non-adaptable activist, the type one. This is Saladin and Richard the Lionheart, both fighting each other for the sake of the truth, the oneness. Both of the mighty noble ones fighting against each other. This is the, 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 the charismatic leaders that want to be seen ahead of the group, always ahead, looking above, and everyone has to see how magnificent they are, the type three. And this is the conformist, type nine, wanting to keep the system stable and everyone following the rules and everyone 
uh, doing what is supposed to be done so there wouldn't be disturbance in the world. And Queen Elizabeth is a great example in this, especially in her younger age. I think she still is there, but I don't know. You never know. Now we move to orange. And this is the modern world, the world of discovery, the world of the Western civilization, the world of more, the world of growth. And this is also covered to some extent in Enneagram books, especially the more modern Enneagram books have started to realize these traits of orange. And this is here now, instead of trusting the group and hiding in the group and following the group, now I trust myself. I free myself from the system, nothing can hold me back. And most of my students that come are coming at this center of gravity, either moving from blue to, from amber to orange or from orange to green or moving around these three stages. So I can see them a lot and I can map this also easily in my world. And in Egypt, again, it's very evident. You see it around everywhere in the modern tycoons, in the industry, in the youth with all their parties, in the high rises. So again, orange is very evident around us and I'm sure all of you have a lot of orange around them. And I like to always joke with my students because every time they discover something, the first question I get is, what should I do? So I found this lovely cartoon of this uh, Zen master sitting and his student, his very orange student for sure, asking him, uh, he's telling his student, nothing happens next. This is it. Just be, just meditate. It's not a process. You're not trying to achieve something. And in orange, we always want to achieve. So what should I do? So, okay, I'm a type three. What should I do? I'm a type five. What should I do next? There's nothing next. Just observe, just stay, just be, just shed the light on the darkness and your soul will shine through. And this type three, uh, sorry, this orange you can find in the charismatic seven, in the intense boss, the eight, in those who have to push ahead through their anxiety to appear in the world, the type six, in the nerd, the scientist, the reader, the one that creates the technology, the type five, in the winner, the type three that has to be charismatic and seen in the objective perfecter that has to perfect the system, the quality control that has to get everything right and have the perfect image, the image of the perfect person. And that takes us to type green. And this is where most of the integral world is in or moving out of. And this is where most of the students are moving into. And actually I see that the greatest thing that these courses and conferences have done is to give a place for green to be especially in our societies, which are mostly red, blue, orange, red, amber, orange. In these societies, green has no place. And what I've realized is that the manifestation of green is very different in the West and in the East. And that actually took me on a huge search of why. And it went all the way back almost a thousand years to the struggle between what I call logos and mythos between mythology and the word and science and understanding. And it seems that the West in general, again, this is stereotypically, the West has an allergy to amber, to blue, while the East has an addiction to amber and blue. And it's this sense of being able to transcend and including amber blue systems that will actually one day give us a healthy sense of green. So in both cases, something is missing. And the green's manifestation, it's, it's content, how it shows in the world is very different in the two societies. And in Egypt, where we stand at a crossroads between the East and the West, you can see both manifestations of green very evident. So you can see them in the elite students of the privileged societies, as I said, yoga. So you see this yoga retreat under the pyramids. You have the surfers and the hippie beach towns and Dahab, if any one of you has been to Dahab, a beautiful green retreat in the green movements in the country, in the Egyptian revolution. So the Egyptian revolution of 2011 was very green and led by this green Nobel prize winner who is a peace uh, winner, very type five. And again, the Egyptian revolution suffered from usually what green suffers from. Okay, I'll topple the old regime, but what now? 
They just stood there not knowing what to do. And the old regime just came back even mightier than before because Green didn't have a leadership. And this, it's very much represented in this, this is the same person, the Nobel literate, where he helped the Egyptian revolution, but he couldn't sustain because he's a five, he couldn't sustain going beyond this professor, this live and let live. And he actually had to leave the country. I think he resides in Austria right now and he tries to help out of Austria. So this is aloofness of the five going away, but trying to build the society. We have the guardian. We have the multi-fascination of the seven. Look at the seven in green and how the world becomes a sense of fascination. I can do everything, I can try everything. And you go into all this depth of colors of the world. And this, the, the custodian, the lover, the type two, Desmond Tutu, the Zen master, type nine, they go into a Zen, a beautiful and dangerous place for type nine. Most of the gurus and the masters of the green come from this place, which can be magnificent, can actually be very, very dangerous if they fall into a sense of spiritual bypass and abuse. You have the trustworthy supporter, the type six, trying to show the flaws in the system. You have the idealist advocate, the type one, advocating again as usual. Let's look at type four in these modern manifestations. Now, blue or amber is hell for four. They want to be unique and different, yet they need to be part of the system. And I have seen four suffer here tremendously. They fall into this melancholy. And unfortunately, this is usually where, where four is described from. So type fours don't like their descriptions in the Enneagram because this is what people talk about, but not, four, not all fours are like this. Especially in the modern world, they have passed this. They fall into a sense of melancholy, sadness, moodiness, frustration, depression, condemning themselves and condemning the world around them, and around them, believing that they are falling into continuous sacrifice. They can become great artists, great poets, they teach us how to touch our emotions and to express our emotions. They teach us how to bring out the best within us. But if they become too suffering, they become isolated, unsociable, feeling no one understands them, feeling no one connects to them. They can even become suicidal or passive suicidal, feeling that when I get rid of this body, I will go back to the divine, to the one, to the origin, to the sense. And I'll go back to my lover, the divine, who will take me. It's me and my lover, my divine, my God. It's us together. We don't want anyone else. So this, this sense of deep suffering and longing for the one. For those who know the, the, the Arabic songs from the Arabic tradition, Fayrouz, one of the magnificent singers, a Lebanese singer, represents this sense very, very much. She's so beautiful. Just listen to her, whatever language you know. And you will feel this sense. Rumi talks about the song of the reed, the sadness of the reed, how the flute just brings the sense of melancholy running through you. This is the blue or the amber four. But in orange, now they can express themselves. Now they can be, they can be unique. They can be different. They can be separate. So they come out and they try to show this special, unique, elite shape. Look at this figure here. If you don't see this picture up here, she's saying, am I looking sufficiently mysterious and deep? Can they see my eliteness, vogue? I want to be different. This is depth here. And they present an image of distinctiveness, standing out. This is a special edition. So special edition is a four in orange coming out. No one is like me, and I want you to see what I have. And if they cannot get what they want, they will rationalize it. They will go after it, and they will create a personal image of success, of beauty, of luxury, of wealth, of being there. And the problem with orange and four is by presenting this image, they somehow feel that they lost connection to themselves. So even though they shine bright in orange, their heart is still suffering tremendously. It's as if the heart is void. I have lost 
deep connection with who I am. I am of the system. I am in the system, but I don't want to be part of the system. I want to leave the system. I want to be special. So it's as if I'm utilizing the system to be me. So four actually suffers in both amber and orange, but in very different ways. And this opens the door to green. And it is in green where the fours actually shine. They come out and they allow their heart to come out into the world, shine into the world. And I call them the queen of hearts. It's the most beautiful place for the fours. They connect to their own hearts. They connect to the other's hearts. I will touch your heart. I will let you touch my heart. They're still careful about their looks. They can be very seductive. They can be very sexy. They can be very shiny, amazing smiles. Everyone notices them. If they feel the beauty of existence, they bring out the deep hearts. Yet they still feel this core deficiency inside. They haven't healed it yet. They hide still an inner secret that no one knows. They feel overwhelmed by presenting their heart to the world. So they're still a bit crying inside. So they're shining, they're happy, they're, 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 they're blessed with bliss, but there's still a dark secret. And it's only when teal, when yellow comes into the picture that we can become whole. We start to integrate the free intelligence centers. We now have sufficiency. It's not lack, it's not deficiency. We access the holy ideas and we access the virtues. So as we saw in red, we access the fixations and passions. We can only fully access the holy ideas and virtues. We can actually access them at each stage, but teal is the bringing in of the holy ideas and virtues. And this is again where the El Sherbini lattice will show up. Hopefully I'll present it next year. And we have a greater capacity to function without force and resistance. We integrate the mind, we become the authentic altruist, the involved wisdom and knowing, the true congruous and service. This is the type three now, has true service to the world. We have the compassionate power. Type eight gives their power with compassion, with heart, and we have the engaged harmony of type nine. They're no longer self-effacing. They are one, they are engaged in the world. And that takes us to turquoise, where now this integration is complete and we have a sense of belonging. We have integrated our shadow side. We are balancing the three centers. We are manifesting now the virtues and holy ideas, not just knowing them and being them, but even manifesting them into the world. There's a sense of continuity of consciousness, a deep connection to spirit, individual and collective, a deep connection to oneness. There's a sense of serenity, a sense of humility, a sense of gnosis, knowing without thinking, connecting to the collective, connecting to the oneness in the universe, a sense of courage, a sense of trust, a sense of leaning on the perfection of the universe. And how does that manifest in type four? In, ty in type four finally reaches the station in teal of sensitive equanimity. They no longer need this moodiness. They no longer need to create emotions. They can now connect to the deep, feelings, emotions. I describe it metaphorically as the ocean. They have always been bouncing on the waves, but now they connect to the depth of the ocean. The surface of the lake is so calm that it's transparent, that they can see everything inside. They have access to their intuition, to their heart. They realize they were not deficient. They never were deficient. Nothing is missing. Their intensity recedes and they realize the power of authentic feelings. They start to be. They realize that the collective system is whole and complete. Nothing is deficient in the wholeness. 
And I am part of this wholeness and I am not deficient within it. They experience the sense of unity and multiplicity together, which is realized as a holistic union, a drop in the ocean, the rays of the sun, the breaths of the wind. They are in a sense of overwhelming beauty. The depth of unity comes through them. There is no separation of identity. All is one and they bring peace and resolution to their heart and they bring peace and a complete sense of calmness and equanimity to all the hearts around them. They shine with the divine light of truthfulness, authenticity and beauty. So the journey of the four from a sense of alienation and separation to a sense of being the psychic and magician, to a sense of becoming the rebel and nonconformist, to the melancholic, to the elite, to the queen of hearts, to the sense of sensitive equanimity, to a sense of holistic union. So that has been a very brief introduction to the stages of the mind, this model here that you see on this three-dimensional model. I will just end with, the, I'll take two minutes of presenting just my school and my work and where you can reach me. So my school is Enneagram Egypt, which is a school of the Consciousness Academy, which I founded with my lovely wife in uh, about seven, eight, seven years, six, seven years ago now. And it has many schools. One of them is Enneagram Egypt. We also have Integral Middle East which is headed actually by my dear friend and colleague, uh, Mohammed Rifat, who presented his integral leadership yesterday and who will be co-teaching with me the stages of the mind next month. Uh, this is our email and our website, and this is how you can reach and register to our courses. We have all the accreditations from the Integral Enneagram Association. And I would like to end with this slide where we currently have two courses running. Enneagram of psychology is the advanced stage of the Enneagram journey. So anyone who knows their type, they're welcome to join where we talk about the psychology, the inner critic, the uh, inner wounds and the shadows and the ego of all the types and how that affects relationships. And we go deeply into relationships using the Enneagram. So this is an advanced stage. It's way beyond most of the Enneagram courses given worldwide. It goes very deep into the psyche and just preparing to knock on the door of spirituality and transformation, which is level three. And that just started. We just had one introductory session. So anyone is welcome to join us next Saturday we start. We also have stages of the heart, also just started one introductory session, which you saw on the three-dimensional map. This is the psycho-spiritual journey, which builds on the Sufi models of awakening and also on some Western and transpersonal models from, uh, from different uh, writers, from David Hawkins, from Asagioli, and from others. And on June the 9th, uh, I will be co-teaching with uh, my dear friend and colleague, Mohammed Rifat. We will be giving the uh, stages of the mind, and it will start on June the 9th. This is how you can reach our courses, or you can just scan this bar, and this slide and the previous slide will be found in the Dropbox or in the folder where you can reach after the conference to reach these slides. And as a special gift for all the lovely attendees, and I'm so happy to have almost 190 people here in the session, uh, we give a 15% off for anyone while registering who uses the code IEC15. And this code will be valid until the end of the month. And I see Anna has shared this slide, uh, upcoming courses and coupons uh, on the chat so you can download it and, and reach us there. So that's it from my side. And uh, I hope I haven't been too fast, too deep. I tried to give you a taste of my models and I can open now for unfortunately just seven minutes of question and answer. Uh -huh. yes, please, yet please reach out to me uh, on the email or on the website or on the courses. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'd be very happy or my administration to answer any of your questions.
So just, please, just I'm one the questions and I see Anna telling me that there's a question coming in. One, one quick question before we before we head off is uh, what, what's the how the spelling of the name the singer that you mentioned Feruz uh, uh, how do you Fairuz. spell that uh, F yeah it's F A I R U Z thank you very I much I will write it here in the chat thank you very much F A R R U Z and again transliteration so you might find a little bit of change around it but this is the main thing. She has a beautiful song singing for Jerusalem from all three perspectives, as if integrating them all from an Islamic and a Christian and a Jewish perspective and trying to hold them all together. She's a Christian, by the way, and she tries to hold all three traditions with, with, uh, with Jerusalem. It's a beautiful song and others. So I see us uh, on, on my chat, a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey and Emma. I see a, a question on the chat. And, and by the way, in my folder that Anna will send you the link, you will also find links to my uh, articles. You will find an article about the framework, an article about the stages of the heart, and you will find a link to uh, my YouTube channel and some of my presentations. So the question is, is there a study on integral union types research? Could you please answer? Now, I am not aware of a study where the union ty Jungian types, the, uh, uh, the uh, Jungian types connected, the 16 types connected to the Enneagram, to the uh, stages or the structure stages or the spiral or the spiritual growth. So I'm not aware of that. Some work has been done trying to connect the Enneagram with the MBTI. And it's just like a kind of mapping so a big percentage of INTJs will either be fives or ones. And it's just a percentage thing. It's a probability thing. But there is no one-to-one -one mapping between the MBTI or the union types and the Enneagram. You can just see tendencies. So most sevens tend to be extroverts, while lots of sevens are introverts. And most fives tend to be introverts, while lots of fives tend to be extroverts. So it's stuff like that. It's just connecting things to each other. And thank you for all the lovely words I'm seeing on the chat. I can see them in front of me, and I, I thank you all. So, uh, do we, Anna, should do we I... have time? Do we have time for one question? Okay, yeah. let's take one question. Okay, and Il... I will take. Il... Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Malcolm. I was just saying, Ildiko seems to have her hand up longest, so maybe we can mm -hmm. take your question, Ildiko. Go ahead. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying I'm not very familiar with the Enneagram um, typology, but from your presentation, it seemed really nicely clear that uh, with, with the developmental devel development of the stages, you kind of enhance your, your main type. And my question would be that at the same time, I also have a sense of that as we develop, we also almost like integrate in some way all the other types on the Enneagram as well. So I don't know if I'm right about that. That's just an intuitive kind of hunch for me. Well, it's... This is what usually people tend to, uh, let's say, um, imagine. It's really what happens is the higher you go, the brighter the manifestation of your light becomes. So you become an enlightened five, an awakened four, uh, a, a shining three. Your greatest gifts show to the world. And you also have more flexibility moving between the different manifestations of the types, but from your center of gravity. So if you are a nine, you never really fully integrate the three or the five or the seven or the two. No, you fully integrate the nine, but you can show all the others at the same time. And I like to express this by looking at the enlightened beings of life. I mean, the enlightened beings, even being enlightened, whom we mostly agree that these are the enlightened beings of history, they each have their character, their individuality. So the Buddha, 
is very five-ish. Moses is very eight-ish. Jesus is very two-ish. Muhammad is very nine-ish. Abraham is very five-ish. So they, Solomon is very three-ish. So you still find even enlightened beings, the type is there. So no, we do not become all the types. We just become flexible, more adaptable in taking all of them and shining with the light we're meant to shine to the world. Thank you. That was very helpful explanation. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. I see still some hands are raised, but we would like to finish on time. So I encourage you very much to stay in touch with Kahat or get in touch with him. And also to continue this conversation on our private Facebook group. So we created for this conference and it offers really additional ways to connect with each other, where you can also share your um, experience from this uh, session. So I will put on again on the chat this uh, Facebook group for you. And first of all, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Khaled, for this amazing session. Please let me express my appreciation for your inspiration and for your presentation, your years of research, your depth of understanding of Enneagram and your ability to present the subject in such an interesting way. Uh, I guess this produced an awesome, awesome session. Thank you so much for this amazing session. And I appreciate, I personally appreciate your approach to connecting all these threads and your enthusiasm, come on, it's really contagious. Thank you so much. And uh, as Halet has shared, we will, um, we, we so have recorded much, this session. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Anna. And thank you all for attending. And I'm so happy to answer your questions on the private or on my email later, because I'm just seeing lots of questions coming in. So thank you so much.